of an era. Allahu Akbar. Palestinians lose a legendary leader. On News & Review today, Yasser Arafat, death of an icon. Hello, I'm Carla Robinson. In the early hours of November 11th, Palestinian President Yasser Arafat died in a Paris hospital. For almost 40 years, Arafat had led the Palestinian people's struggle for a state to call their own. He had come to be recognized around the world as the living symbol of that long and bloody struggle. So when he died, many people wondered what would happen next. Would it lead to even more violence in the Middle East, or would it usher in a new era of cooperation between Palestinians and Israelis, and finally give peace a chance? The beginning of the end of the Arafat era began in mid-October when he fell ill at his compound in Ramallah, a battle-scarred old British fort known as the Maktara. He had been confined there by Israel for almost three years. When doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong with him, it was decided that Arafat should travel to France for urgent treatment. He left waving and blowing kisses at those who had come to see him off for what would turn out to be the last time. When he arrived in Paris, Arafat was taken to a military hospital. Doctors there treated him for some kind of unspecified blood disorder but couldn't save his life. After almost two weeks of confusing reports on his condition, word finally came. The old fighter had lost his last battle. Here's the CBC's Adrian Arsenault. It was the middle of the night, far from home, when the end finally came, and it was utterly anticlimactic. Monsieur Yasser Arafat, President de l'Autorité Palestinienne, est décédé. Mr. Yasser Arafat, the President of the Palestinian Authority, the hospital spokesman said, has died. <laughs> Expected, certainly, but still, what a realization for Palestinians to wake up to. For hours this morning, there was just quiet and long faces and a few tears. And then the banners emerged, and everywhere in the West Bank and Gaza, the voices raced. Yasser Arafat, large in life, maybe larger in death. He's the leader. Our father shouts this man. He'll never die. I am here to fight and to win. I'm here this strutting and self-styled revolutionary always fostered the impression that one day he'd go out in a hail of bullets. He was forever, it seemed, a martyr in waiting, with a clear philosophy. The land belonged to Palestinians and those who took it will be defeated. And our road took him back to our homes. He got neither his glorious death nor his glorious burial in Jerusalem. Israel said no to that wish. Instead, Arafat will be buried on the grounds of the Mukata, this place where he was kept under siege for nearly two and a half years. It was one final disappointment after a life that had seen more than its share of them. Yasser Arafat liked to portray himself as both a fighter and a peacemaker, but he lost just about every battle he ever fought. He never lived to see his dream of a Palestinian state come true. And in recent years, he had come to be seen by many as an obstacle to peace in the region. The CBC's Adrian Arsenault looks at the stormy life and times of Yasser Arafat. Yasser Arafat was around for so long and changed mantles so often that he defies any neat description. Revolutionary, autocrat, freedom fighter, dictator, peacemaker, assassin, extremist, living symbol. Those were a few of the labels Arafat carried over the years. He created his own myths, beginning with his birthplace, which was, he always insisted, Jerusalem. In fact, Mohammed Abdul Rauf Arafat al-Qudwa al-Husseini was born in Cairo in 1929. As a young man, he was nicknamed Yasser, meaning carefree. The 1948 war with Israel and the Jewish state's takeover of Arab lands instilled in him a grim, lifelong cause. In 1964, Arafat was directing guerrilla operations against Israel. The PLO was formed that year and Arafat became its chairman. But he was often a hated guest in the countries he chose to operate. King Hussein of Jordan in 1970 ordered his forces to crush Arafat, slaughtered thousands of his fighters and expelled the PLO. Arafat escaped to Beirut, where he proceeded once again to set up his own government. 
Throughout the 70s, he ran a campaign of hijackings, bombings, abductions, killings, and general mayhem all aimed at the state of Israel. I am declaring here by the name Those were his days of revolutionary glory. His cause of redress for the Palestinians was adopted by the left worldwide. In 1974, he famously addressed the United Nations with a gun stuck in his belt. I have come bearing an olive branch and a freedom fighter's gun. But Israel was intent on destroying Arafat and his organization. In 1982, it set its tanks into Lebanon after him. Arafat and his fighters had no choice, though. They left Beirut, setting up a new headquarters in Tunis. Arafat, the great survivor, eventually survived a dozen assassination attempts, many by Israel. In 1990, he made his worst political mistake. Arafat embraced Saddam Hussein during the Gulf War and in doing so alienated even the Arab world. In Israel, the first Palestinian intifada raged without him. Militants were resisting and dying as Arafat languished far away. He had only one card left and he played it, peace. It all led to the White House lawn and this image. Arafat, despised in Israel, shaking hands with a rather hesitant Yitzhak Rabin, who'd supervised many of the attempts to destroy him. And nearly a year later, his return. July 1st, 1994, Palestinians put their misery aside to welcome their leader, their living flag. He promised them so much more than he could deliver, and their lives only became more difficult. In September of 2000, the second intifada began, more bloody than the first. With Arafat at the helm, Palestinians targeted Israeli citizens in restaurants, shopping malls, their homes, their cars. Israel fought back with a vengeance. Its invasions and incursions killed thousands of Palestinian men, women, and children. And Israel isolated Arafat, imprisoning him in his Ramallah compound, where he got more fragile physically, but certainly not politically. From these ruins, he ran his corrupt police state, systematically pushing aside anyone who ever approached his popularity. He now leaves his people without the realization of their dreams and without their living symbol of Arab nationalism. As Palestinians mourned Arafat's death, preparations went ahead for his funeral. And like so many things in the Middle East, it involved all kinds of diplomatic negotiations. Because of the Israeli occupation of the Palestinian territories, many world leaders refused to travel there. So Arafat got two funerals. The official one took place in Egypt. It was a somber, orderly affair. Representatives from 50 countries, including Canada, attended the ceremony, but thousands of police and soldiers made sure ordinary Egyptians were kept far away. But when Arafat's body arrived back in Ramallah for burial in the grounds of his compound, nothing could hold his people back. Thousands of them surged into the compound, overwhelming security guards who fired into the air to try to stop them. Funeral plans had to be scrapped. Instead, Arafat was carried into a hastily built gravesite and laid to rest, his tomb scattered with soil from Jerusalem's Al-Aqsa Mosque. Yasser Arafat left no designated successor, so many feared a violent power struggle could break out. But so far, the transition has been a peaceful one. Former Prime Minister Mahmoud Abbas was asked to take charge until elections to choose a new Palestinian leader are held in early January. But replacing a legend like Arafat won't be easy. The CBC's Don Murray looks at Arafat's legacy and at the dangers and opportunities that may have been created by his death. In his last redoubt, a last portrait of the man who for 40 years was the Palestinian face in the mind of the world. Copied and caricatured, it became a symbol, loathed or loved, depending on who you were. Ramallah was where he spent the last three years of his life. Just 20 minutes from Jerusalem, the busy city became the de facto capital of the Palestinians due to their leader's presence. A presence that over four decades had soaked into their souls. I grew up with Arafat, he says. I've never known anyone else. He tried to make a Palestinian state, and I can't imagine Palestine without him. 
We are living under the most difficult times, and the transition is not going to be easy. But Saeed Zadani is a Palestinian moderate, uh, human rights uh, campaigner, no a political benefit. analyst. I have been very critical of him over the, four, the past four years. I think he should have done all sorts of things. He should have, have avoided all sorts of things. He made so many mistakes. But I think it's unfair to say that he is the one to blame for this deteriorating conditions because there are other factors and other actors. This is the bitter fruit of the Second Intifada, the second uprising against Israeli occupation of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, launched four years ago. Launched, the Israelis say, at Arafat's order. In the wake of another suicide attack, Israeli soldiers pen in women and children at a checkpoint near Ramallah. Barbed wire is only temporary. A great barrier that plows through towns and walls in Palestinians on the West Bank seems permanent. This is Israel's work, an answer, it says, to the murderous defiance unleashed by Arafat. I think that Arafat was an obstacle for the emergence of a moderate Palestinian leadership, which actually is there. Boaz Ganor is the director of the Israeli Institute for Counterterrorism and a former assistant to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. I think that Arafat was deceiving the world uh, from day one. So he used both, you know, double language, double policy, uh, uh, paying lip service, uh, condemning terrorism on one hand and promoting terrorism and sending people to this mission and giving them money to launch this attack on, on the other side. So if you ask me, I don't see any positive side of the time that uh, Arafat ruled the Palestinian uh, arena. Even the praise of his supporters is strangely muted. He left us no institutions, one senior Palestinian figure muttered. His legacy is Israel's scorn and intransigence, an uncertain interim leadership, and the possibility of civil strife. The bloody calling card of the second intifada was the suicide bomb attack. Such attacks were largely the work of Hamas and Islamic Jihad, rivals to Arafat's Palestine Liberation Organization. They now march in search of seats at the table of power. Arafat's successors talk of new elections to reinforce their legitimacy, but first they must deal with these groups and try to disarm them. If they resist, the price could be high. I don't know any other Arab regime that was ready uh, to give Islamic radical movements the ability uh, uh, to be active and use uh, uh, munitions and, wep and weapons as much as they can in their own territory because it threatened them and they have to neutralize that. I believe that will, they will never neutralize themselves in a voluntary way and therefore that it will be necessary that it will be a period of time of a civil war. Violence begat brutal retaliation, bombs from the air, bulldozers on the ground, grinding to dust houses of suspected militants, leaving only a crop of misery. Arafat's Ramallah compound was shelled. He was not allowed out. The leader had become a prisoner and a pariah. Israel refused to deal with him. The so-called international roadmap to peace was ignored. Instead, the Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon acted unilaterally. Israel, he said, would abandon the Gaza Strip. A new leader should steer a new way uh, in order to put an end to this uh, myth or to this illusion of Mr. Sharon that he can proceed unilaterally. I think Palestinians should take the roadmap seriously, should temporarily at least put an end to violence against Israelis, so, and the Israelis should be tested, really. Uh, to, and uh, I am sure that the Sharon government will fail the test. Will Sharon negotiate? Gaza, says Ganor, is a clue. Sharon has become an old general in a hurry. It takes two to tango, and you need a partner. I thought that Arafat was a mistake. I, I'm now convinced that he was a mistake. Now there is an opportunity. I think that Sharon sees it, in a way, in the same, in the same perspective. 
Under Arafat, it was his people's fate to become Israel's adversary and its shadow. Each nation defined itself in battling the other. Arafat's end could be a beginning for his people. With luck and new leadership, they could emerge from the half-life of the shadow nation. And so far, there have been some encouraging signs. U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell recently visited the region to urge Israelis and Palestinians to resume peace talks. The Israeli government has promised to do all it can to make sure the elections scheduled for January can be held as smoothly as possible. And for its part, the Palestinian leadership has called for a suspension of terrorist attacks against Israel. For now, at least, the end of the Arafat era has brought some new hope for peace in the Middle East. And that's News in Review. I'm Carla Robinson. Thanks for watching. at sea. The silence was very uh, frightening because my first impression was that everybody in the control room was dead. It happened on board a Canadian submarine. The result was deadly. The Minister of Defence has been advised by the Chief of Defence Staff of the tragic death of Lieutenant Saunders. On News and Review today, saving a submarine.